All right. इधर देखें इधर देखें I seek your permission to start. All right. So the first question in the midterm uh, involved uh, a junction between two dissimilar metals. क्या बात सुनो? आप क्लास में बैठना चाहते हो कि नहीं? Two dissimilar metals. Different conductivity, sigma 1, sigma 2. Sigma 1 is higher than sigma 2. So this could be copper, this could be lead or aluminum or carbon, something that has a smaller conductivity or a higher resistivity. And the same current flows across this junction. In steady state, that has to be the case. Uh, the current in this section must be the same as the current in this section. So the point, I, the question I asked is, what's the amount of charge that's stored here? Okay. Since it's a, a non-uniform material, the material is different here from here, there has to be some charge that is stored here. So when the currents equalize, this charge that's stored on this junction remains constant, but it's non-zero. There has to be some charge here. Another way of looking it at this point a problem is that if there is some charge stored on this junction, the electric fields in this region must be, diff must be different from the electric field in this region. Whenever there is a charge on a surface, the electric field sees a discontinuity. And we've seen this uh, bef before. And the electric fields are different. The electric fields have to be different. Why do they have to be different? First, they imply that there is a charge stored on the surface. Okay, but why do the electric fields have to be different? Because? In order to keep the current same. Sorry? In order to keep the current same. In order to keep the current same. If the electric fields were the same in these two regions, since the conductivities are different, the mobilities are different, same electric field would result in different mobility, would, would result in different velocities. Different velocities means different currents. But if the currents have to remain equal, the electric fields have to remain different. Okay? So how do we calculate the charge on the surface? Let's draw a Gaussian surface. And this is the hint that I provided in the exam. So I have some charge here which I wish to calculate. The cross-sectional area of this wire is capital A. Now I can create a, chart, a Gaussian surface. Now the electric fields are always parallel to the axis of the conductor. So if this is E1, this is E2. So I would like to draw a Gaussian surface that matches the direction of the electric field. So the surface that I will draw will look something like this. This is one possible surface that I can draw. A cylinder that is parallel to the axis of the conductor. And this cross section is small a. Now I call it small a because I want to differentiate it from capital A. Now if I look on this end, the electric field is pointing to the right and this area is pointing to the left. So the flux through this surface, through this end cap is minus E1 small a, right? Because electric field here is E1. The electric field in this region, by the way, is uniform because all of this region is just one material, okay? The electric field through this region is pointing to the right and the area vector is also pointing to the right. So, due to this end cap, I will get a flux E2 small a. Now, this circular surface, the lateral surface of the cylinder, the area vector is always normal to the electric field, whatever the electric field is. So the flux through this circular lateral side is zero. So this is the total flux to this closed Gaussian surface. This must equal one over epsilon naught times the charge enclosed. Now the charge enclosed is the charge only in this region. Okay? So let's call the charge enclosed Q. 
Now this means that Q has to be equal to epsilon naught A E2 minus E1. Okay, this is a charge enclosed only in this region. Okay, just this charge, the charge enclosed in this region, Q enclosed. But I would like to find this total charge. Okay, so this Q enclosed over small a is a charge density. Okay. So, if I take this A to the other side, I get the charge density. I multiply the charge density with this total area, I get the total charge. So, the total charge on this surface is epsilon naught capital A E2 minus E1. Right? You there. So, so if, if I missed out a step, I take this small A to the other side, I get Q enclosed over small a. This is the charge density. Okay. This equals epsilon naught E2 minus E1. Now if I want to find the total charge, I will just multiply this charge density by the total area which is capital A. So I get this as this to be the total charge on this surface. Agreed? The charge density on this surface is uniform. Okay, now this is the total charge that's on the surface, but none of these options has the electric fields inside. So if I look at the options here, none of them have electric field inside. They are expressed in terms of the conductivities. Okay, so I know that the, the electric field is related to the, the current density is related to the electric field. So I know that uh, J is sigma E. Okay, this is the current density. The current per unit area equals the conductivity into the electric field. Okay, so if I put a 1 here, the conductivity of material 1, I need electric field of material 1. Okay, and since the current densities are the same in both regions, I will get Sigma 1 E1 must equal Sigma 2 E2 because this J is simply the current per unit area. Okay, the current both the regions is the same. Therefore, by Ohm's law, conductivity 1 multiplied by electric field 1 must be equal to the conductivity 2 minus the electric field 2. Okay, so now what I would like to do. I would like to put in the conductivities in place of the electric field. Agreed? Now could you do this step on your own and see if I can get one of those options. E1 equals J over sigma 1. 
So I get epsilon naught A into J. 1 over sigma 2 minus 1 over sigma 1. Now A into J is simply the current. So I get epsilon naught I 1 over sigma 2 minus 1 over sigma 1. Alright, so the correct answer is part D. Disrespectful I got. Alright, let's move on to the next question. G. Steady state current only implies that the current must be uniform in all sections. Right. The electric fields is non-uniform. The electric fields adjust themselves in such a way that the current has to be uniform. Because the current depends upon the electric field, it depends upon the conductivity of the material, it also depends upon the cross-sectional area. So the key is that you have, if you have a series circuit, there is no branching off, the current has to be the same throughout the circuit. Okay, so you adjust the electric fields and the surface charges in a way that the current remains constant. Now the next question deals with a spherical resistor. Now, when you come to look at things, things seem really easy. But when you are in the midst of a midterm or an exam, I think minds get a little bogged down, nervousness creeps in and you are not able to look at things in daylight. You think that everything is in dark pitch night. So what this question is actually quite easy if you come to look at it. Suppose I have a planar resistor, just a plain resistor, okay, of certain length L, okay, or width L. Let's call this the width of this resistor. And the cross-sectional area, this is the area of this face, suppose that's A, okay? Now current is flowing through this resistor and current is flowing like this, okay? It goes through the resistor like this. Now this current, of course, would see some resistance and that resistance of this material R, of this plane object, What's the resistance? It's simply the resistivity into this length or width L divided by A. Okay, this is common knowledge. Okay, we looked at this formula. Now suppose I take this planar resistor and twist it. Remember, this is a resistor, it's a plane. Okay, and I'm looking at it from the I'm looking at a cross section. I'm looking at it from the side. Now I take this planar resistor and make it into a shell. So I twist it so that it becomes a shell. Like this. Now it's a shell and current is again flowing radially outwards like this right it's again radially outward no difference from this situation still the current that's flowing radially outward would see the same resistance if this width is L and the area of this surface is capital A still the current will see the same, same resistance. We are assuming that the thickness of this shell is really small. So now if we have a spherical resistor such that it's hollow from the inside and it's a big resistor. So here there is nothing and this is the material of the resistor. Okay. And this, resist, this radius is R1 and this radius is R2. And we are interested in finding the resistance of this resistor. Let's call it small r1 and small r2 so that you are not confused with the resistance. I call this small r1 and I call this small r2. Okay. Now what I could do, I could make a small 
shell inside this bigger shell. The thickness of this shell I call it D small r and what's the cross sectional area through which the current has to pass it's simply 4 pi r square. So the resistance of this small shell D capital R it's a small shell so I put in a small resistance is simply the resistivity of this material the thickness which is just analogous to this width that is dr and the cross sectional area through which this current has to pierce and that's 4 pi r square okay so if i want to calculate the total resistance offered by this bulk this matter it's simply the integral with respect to the radius and we're going from small r1 to big to r2 and if i compute this integral i get rho over 4 pi r minus 2 minus 1 over small r limits r2 to r1 quite straightforward minus rho over 4 pi 1 over R2 minus 1 over R1. Question that this R2 is really really large. It's so I can take this to be infinity. This this number is much smaller than this number. So if this number is smaller, I can put this equal to zero, and I'm left with rho over 4 pi R1. Okay. So this is the resistance of this spherical shell. Notice that even if this shell is really big, the resistance does not go to zero. Can anyone explain why it doesn't go to zero? Even though if I just fill all of space with this material, I get a huge amount of matter. But why is the resistance not equal to infinity? See, this seems like a strange result. No matter how big a shell I use, the resistance is independent of the outer radius. It only weakly depends upon the outer radius because so this is really small. The key is that the shell has to be really big. So, how can you reconcile this with common sense? G. The cross section area difference is that of a smaller circle R1. Good. So what uh, the gentleman is saying that, all right, if you move away from from the center, you go further and further away. Current that's further away sees a much bigger cross-sectional area. So the resistance drops further away. The resistance keeps on dropping because if you move further and further away from the shell, the area, the cross-sectional area that this shell, the small shell, poses to the current is really large because this area is 4 pi r square. Bigger the r, bigger will be this area. So just imagine that if this area were to become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, the resistance will drop because here the area is in the denominator. So if you want to pass current through, through a bigger cross sectional area where the resistance is smaller. So if you move further and further away from the center here, the area that the current sees becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So the resistance keeps on dropping. Hence, all of the resistance is almost is posed, is presented by the smaller cross-sectional area. That means it's presented by the smaller radius R1. That's why it's limited by R1, not limited by R2. So even though you have a big resistor, lot of matter out there, but the matter that's further away from the center doesn't really matter. It does not, not contribute to the resistance because it presents a bigger and bigger cross-sectional area to the current. Okay? Chale, aage chalte hai. <coughs> Alright, this was a numerical question. It's about brine, seawater, which is sodium chloride. 
and we assume that the hydrogen and the hydroxide ions don't contribute to the conductivity. All the con conductivity is because of the sodium and the chloride ions. Yeah, sodium or chloride ions. Now what we have here is is a tube. We apply a voltage across it. Some voltage V. Okay, there's some resistivity in rho. Alright. And what we are interested in is finding the average drift velocity. Okay. Now, if the cross sectional area is capital A, by the way, the cross sectional area is not given in, in, in this question, so that's fine. So, the current is, the total current is by Ohm's law V over the resistance. The resistance is simply the resistivity into the length, the length is L into the cross sectional area. Now where is this current coming from? This current is coming from the sodium ions as well as the chloride ions. The negative, the chloride ions are negatively charged, sodium ions are positively charged, they move in opposite direction, both of them contribute to the current. Okay? So this I is basically coming from the sodium ions which have a charge, the concentration of the sodium ions, the drift velocity of the sodium ions into the cross sectional area. So this is the contribution of current due to the sodium ions and this is the contribution of current due to the chloride ions and both of them are additive. Sodium ion chloride ions are moving in opposite direction because they are oppositely charged. So both of them are contributing to current in the same direction. They are adding up to the current. So charge on the chloride ion NCl VCl A. Okay. So in general, okay. Do the sodium, so this is the total current I. So, do the sodium and chloride ions carry the same charge? Yes. Yes. But same magnitude? Yeah, because that's how sodium chloride is made. That's how any ionic compound is made. One becomes a positively charged ion, the other becomes a negatively charged ion, the same valency appears. So, this is the same for both of them. The Carrier concentration is the same because it's a pH 7 compound, same number of sodium ions as there are of chloride ions. So N, cross sectional area is the same. A, are the drift velocities the same? the drift velocity is XC only. Q. The drift velocity depends upon the scattering time, it depends upon the mass of the ion. So the drift velocities are different. They are diff th these anions and cations have different masses. One is mass number 23, the other is mass number 35. They are different masses. They will have different scattering times. So different conductivities, different drift velocities. Okay. So I will have VNA plus VCL. Okay. Now what I've asked is the average drift velocity of the ions. Okay, so this equals Q N A. This equals two times the average drift velocity. Okay, and I equate this with this expression V A rho over L. The area just goes away. All the other quantities are given. And I find out that the average drift velocity is the middle one. Okay, 2.5 into 10 to the power minus 7 meters per second. Ali, first of all, sir, point to the All right, let's move on. <coughs> now, this question number four is in fact simpler to what you did in a tutorial because in the tutorial you had an infinite regress of capacitors now you have an infinite ladder of resistors so this was actually simpler G N concentration is yeah. number of atoms number of ions per unit volume 
per cubic meter. ठीक है जी. अगर आपके पास एल्युमिनियम आयन्स है, एल्युमिनियम क्लोराइड है, ठीक है? तो एल्युमिनियम आयन्स की वजह से प्लस चार्ज विल बी थ्री, ओके? And there will be three times as many chloride ions because aluminium chloride, suppose, is AlCl3. So there will be one aluminium ion and there will be three chloride ions. So the concentration of chloride ions will be three times as much as aluminium ions. Okay? Alright, now let's look at this question. Could anyone, was anyone able to, I know a lot of you have actually guessed on this and you've reach the correct answer by elimination okay that's a bit sneaky but you'll get full credit for being sneaky however you have to look at this problem on its own merit and what is the merit in this question suppose i have a resistor another resistor and this chain carries on till infinity Now each of these resistances is the same. Now I am interested in knowing the equivalent resistance an observer sees from this end. But if you look at this chain from here, you break up this chain anywhere. You break it up here, here or anywhere. You still see the same resistance because it goes up to infinity. In other words, if you are on an infinite line, you can stand anywhere on that line and be no different. Okay? So, the resistance that's seen here is also our equivalent. Okay? So, I can replace this circuit by the following. R. This resistance is R. And the entire resistance that's ahead of it is R equivalent. Okay, so all of this is the same as R equivalent. Now I can solve this circuit. I know most of you electrical engineers are fond of solving circuits. So I can replace this circuit by the following R and the parallel combination of R and R equivalent. So I can replace both of these resistors by a single resistor. And what's this resistance? <coughs> So isn't it R into R equivalent over R plus R equivalent? Is this correct? Yes. Okay. So I can replace both of these resistances. So this equals this, this equals this, and this equals just one resistance which is R plus R into R equivalent R plus R equivalent, okay? But this has to be equal to R equivalent, okay? So, R equivalent equals R plus R into R equivalent, R plus R equivalent. Now, I need to solve this for R equivalent. I have to find out what R equivalent is. So, I get R plus R equivalent I get R square plus R R equivalent plus R R equivalent. I get a 2 here. Okay. So I get R into R equivalent plus R equivalent square equals GD. No, that's not correct. That's... Aap uta sakti? Suno baat, suno.
और डेली टेन मिनट उसके लिए होती है नेगेटिव डाइवर्जिंग फील्ड है उसको मुझे पता नहीं था लेकिन मैंने देखा था कि जो डेली आउटपुट है वो भी डाइवर्जिंग फील्ड तो आपने एलिमिनेशन से किया so if I just gave you this this field and I asked you if it's possible or impossible without giving you other options would you tell me could you tell me why is this impossible could anyone tell me why this is impossible ji aap batayin because the direction uh, of this changing at every point it's not like in ये रीजनिंग ठीक नहीं है आप बताओ आप आपने हाथ खड़ा किया था जी But there is no conductor here. There is no conductor here. Ji. If you elongate the line, what about these lines? These lines, if you elongate them, they will cross over at this point charge. So, particular charge, so in an electric field where there is no charge present. So, what about these diverging? If you elongate them, they will cross cross over. They are coming from the charge. But can't we have a dist? How do you know that? What if I place a charge here, here, here? What? Why can't I have a distribution of charges that actually makes makes me have this field? G. You see, I'm in three dimensions. I can place charges anywhere. So I'm at an exceptional liberty to place charges at wherever I like. I can have positive, negative charges. I can have dipoles, quadrupoles, anything. So, नहीं नहीं मेरा नहीं ख्याल है इंटरसेक्शन वाला आर्ग्यूमेंट है यहाँ पे जी What will cancel it? But the fields are at different points. How can a field at one point cancel out a field at another point? This is not possible. You have field at one point constantly changing directions. You are not allowed to take the resultant of these electric fields. If you take the resultant of these electric fields is zero. But you are not allowed to do that because the field is point by point. Anyone who knows the answer. Is Abir in the class? Aap bata. आपका सवाल जो आप ठीक था या गलत था? जो आप ठीक था इसलिए ठीक था क्योंकि बाकी सारे पॉसिबल नहीं हैं। मतलब बाकी सारे कोई सारे चांसेस बना सकता है, सारे ये नहीं बना सकता था। लेकिन देखो आपके पास बहुत लिबर्टी के स्टैटिक चांसेस कहीं 3D में कहीं भी प्लेस कर सकते हो। हाथ नो आ ओम्स लॉ यार तो करंट तो है ही नहीं। सर ओम्स लॉ सर रोल्स लॉ। सर रोल्स लॉ यूज़ करें अगर हम दो
जीरो तो नहीं आ रहा एरिया भी आउटवर्ड है इलेक्ट्रिक फील्ड भी आउटवर्ड है अच्छा तो अंदर नहीं हो सकता बाहर हो सकता है बाहर तो हो सकता है एनी वन एनी वन गिव गिव रीजनेबल आंसर टू दिस जी थिंक इन टर्म्स ऑफ ओके बताओ so uh, electric field originates from where charge is right okay so the charge at all of these points that's electric field originated carry or tangent is being shown at that point again from a charge electric field is not only going on in one direction but it's going on in all directions no but why are you constraining the charges to lie in this circle the charges can lie anywhere they can be anywhere but uh, they'll always be थिंक इन टर्म्स ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिक पोटेंशियल एंड दैट इलेक्ट्रिक फील्ड इज अ कंजर्वेटिव फील्ड वॉट हैपन्स वेन यू गो वर आउट क्लोज लूप इन स्पेस इन वेयर दर इज इलेक्ट्रिक फील्ड what is the change in potential zero so if i take this closed loop if i go around the circuit okay if i go around this circuit the electric field here is tangent okay and my small dl is also tangent okay so i take this e and take its dot product with the small displacement i get e dot dl and likewise i go round and round and round in the circuit i form these dot products all throughout the circuit okay e dotted with dl i go around the complete circuit from point a and i go back to point a okay take the negative of this this gives me the change in potential is the same all suppose it's the same all around the circle so i'm taking the dot product between two parallel vectors so i get e and the integral of dl all of this gives me 2 pi the radius of the circle the circumference get a minus sign here so this is non zero but since the electric field is conservative the right hand side has to be zero if i go from a go all around the circle and come back here the change in potential must be zero so this is zero and this is an impossibility since all around the circle if i make a closed path a closed trajectory the change in potential has to be zero but if i have tangential fields like this i cannot satisfy this condition therefore such a field cannot exist such a circularly rotating field cannot exist a field cannot have a curl but only when we talk about static charges if you just have static charges we cannot have a field configuration like this it's impossible with moving charges yes and we learn about that when we learn about electrodynamics hence this is impossible okay i think you are cleverer than i so can you please explain that e of e is quite possible you can have a situation like this in which you make a a crescent shaped conductor here you have another crescent shaped conductor this is positively charged negatively charged okay so the electric field has to be normal to the surface of the conductor the electric field would be like this okay so you can have a coaxial conductor okay you can have a divergent field it's possible <coughs> all right so we have a bat we have two batteries connected end to end all right we were i asked you the most likely distribution of surface charge along the the wires okay now could anyone volunteer to describe what's going on here 
Could anyone describe what is the correct answer and why is that the correct answer? A is the correct answer. Any other options? Up to the which option? I believe it should be B if you consider the numerically the number of charges that you can. It is just approximate. Don't go for numerics here. I'm just considering because in the tutorial you have questions in which the number of charges at each position they did matter. I can I cannot determine the number of charges. I just need to look at the gradient here. Why is A the correct answer? Because between the positive and the negative the potential. Could you come over? Could you come over and describe? Field has to be constant throughout the throughout the circuit the, along the along the wires. Uh, so, so the char positive charges and the negative charges will. Okay. Uh, uh, these charges has to decrease in some form. But but we 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 know that the bet from the positive to the negative terminal it has to the charges has to decrease from positive to negative but but then there is a another battery over here uh, we know that at the negative terminal of the battery there, there is a large large piece of negative charges and at the positive uh, terminal of the body there are lo lots of positive charges so th this is the only configuration which fits it which which fits the, the explanation all right good All right, that was a quite a recent description. So what we have here are two batteries, and no by symmetry. Whatever happens at this positive terminal must happen at this positive terminal. Whatever happens at this negative terminal must happen at this negative terminal. Okay, so there has to be some symmetry here. There's a constant electric field throughout the wires. It's constant because the current has to be constant throughout the wires. There is no change in the cross-sectional area of the wires. It's the same material everywhere. Therefore, there has to be a charge gradient. Okay. Now, this charge gradient produces electric field like this. This charge gradient produces electric field like this, like this, like this. So, there is a conventional current that is flowing in this direction. This is eliminated because this doesn't show any charge distribution. And this is not possible at all because it's the same uniform charge distribution and such a uniform charge distribution cannot produce an electric field. Now what about this? This is impossible because this negative battery is distinct from this negative terminal of the battery and by symmetry that's not possible. There's no difference between this negative terminal and this negative terminal. So the only charge distribution that can take place that can cause an electric field and cause a current density in the proper direction is the following. At this point, halfway in between, there is no surface charge. This is the correct 
from 1 to 0.5, from this point to this point, the potential has a sharper slope. This slope is 4 times this slope. Here the slope is 1 unit. Here the slope is 4 units. Okay. At point 9, you get some potential and inside the battery from 9 to 1, you are raised back to the original potential because once you move around a closed loop, the change in potential has to be zero. And the electric field in the battery needs to be really large. Needs to be really large so that you can get back from from zero potential to the EMF of the battery within a small distance of the battery. So the electric field inside the battery is really large and it's totally different from the electric field outside the battery. Okay? Inside the battery, the electric field is in a different direction from, from the wire because once you get a drop in potential inside the battery, you get a raise in potential if you're in the proper direction. So the correct answer to this question is this one. All right. Okay, now I made a correction. I already made a correction in the exam. This has to be a straight line here. So is this clear that the correct answer to this question is part D? Yes. Because we can look at it quantitatively. Let's look at it quantitatively. 